This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, episode 065. Welcome to the show created by vets featuring absolutely no pets. This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, hosted by Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Our resident veterinarians have swapped out their stethoscopes in favor of microphones to bring you the Veterinary Project Podcast, a show focused on real conversations aimed to connect this amazing profession full of remarkable people. Through the sharing of collective stories and wisdom and connecting over the many unique challenges we face, we invite you to join our community of veterinary professionals leading intentional lives. And now, here are the hosts of the Veterinary Project Podcast, Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Hey, what's happening, everyone? Thanks for joining us today, and welcome to another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Something a little different for you today, we are catching up with an old friend, Dr. Brent Mayab. If that name sounds familiar, that's because he was our guest on episode 008, which aired September 16th, 2020. So a little over a year ago, we dove into all things personal finance, and Brent was the very first person to have a money conversation with us. And in fact, he raised his hand, he reached out and said, hey, I really want to have money conversations and bring those to the veterinary community. And as a reminder, Brent is the global chief medical officer for Royal Canaan. So a very accomplished veterinarian, uh, a leader in the industry. And since our previous conversation, he's actually taken things a step further and he's now enrolled in a graduate program in personal finance. So he recognized his passion for helping veterinarians with this money conversation in personal finance, wanted to get more educated and is diving into that. So this conversation is kind of um, picking off from that. It's a continuation where we just continue the personal finance conversation around all things money. And you can see the passion that Brent has for helping veterinarians and veterinary professionals. So without any further ado, I give you our catch up conversation with Dr. Brent Mayab. All right, Brent, great to have you back on the podcast. Thanks for joining us again. Glad to be back. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we've been uh, catching up here and it was, it was so good seeing your face. And then we were, I was looking back on our past episode and it has been over a year and it doesn't feel like that to me. Like it was like the blink of an eye and, and here we are like, you know, 13, 14 months later. So much has happened in the year. And I, I agree with you. I think it's made the time just fly by. It has. It has. So, so what we're doing here, Brent, is, I mean, obviously you are a leader in the veterinary space um, and we had a great conversation with you previous, previously. We wanted to bring you back on and continue the conversation around money. And I recently re-listened to our episode and I was just smiling at, at the part where we talked about how so many people run away from the money conversation and you actually raised your hand. And I remember back then you reached out to us and you said, I want to have the money conversation. And I was like, this is what leaders do is they step into it. So tell us a little bit about how you've stepped in even more uh, into this area in the, in the past year since we talked to you last. Yeah. Well, well thanks for the opportunity to talk about that. I am. Um... I actually started studying personal finance, um, I guess, in a, in a more academic way. I enrolled in a graduate program. And some of this came from, I think, you know, uh, on, on the positive side, people are starting to have more conversations, um, you know, within the veterinary profession about money. I think it's almost necessitated by the fact that the loan situation, you know, had, had kind of grown to what it is. And you know, certainly um, it's, it's good overall that these money conversations are happening. But one of the things I started to notice is that, you know, I feel like in, in my own situation, I've been very blessed that the path I'm on has gotten me to where it, it's gotten me. But, um, you know, I found that there are a lot of folks out there who are giving advice with really good intent that is sort of like, well, this, this worked for me. So this is exactly what you should do. Or, or maybe they've heard, you know, someone else uh, from the financial world give specific advice and they're just repeating it. And again, I think they're, they've got really good intent. Um, but I think as humans, especially if, if you give advice from your own experience, it's like, 
well, if it worked, it's because um, of my skill. And if it didn't work, it's because I wasn't lucky or the circumstances were stacked against me. And, and I just think there's a lot of different paths for people, depending on their very unique circumstances, on what's the best sort of path forward from a money perspective. And certainly there can be some common components across all paths. But like I just I thought about that and I thought, you know, rather than uh, give my own anecdote and say this is what you should consider doing, I just want to study this more formally and look at all of those options. And, and it has it has really opened my eyes to a lot of different things that I didn't know anything about. And, you know, um, and so that's 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 what I'm doing is I'm taking some graduate classes now in this area. Man, that is fascinating. So, you know, kind of understanding this, it's, it's, it's kind of like, hey, you had your money tool belt and you had, you know, a few tools in there and maybe recognize, wait a minute, there's, there's spaces and, and tools missing. I'm going to go find those and learn more and even, you know, learn what you don't know. Um, right. And, and diving into that program. So I'm curious, tell us a little bit about, you know, some of the new learnings or maybe light bulb moments or things you just weren't aware of, you know, a year, a year and a half ago. Sure. Well, you know, and again, very similar, you know, my experience had really been mainly with either mutual funds or stocks is kind of my main money tools. And, and again, that, that worked well for me. But this has really opened my eyes to a lot of other possibilities as far as there are other tools out there. Now, it's also shown me, you know, that there are some probably less than ideal tools that unfortunately, I think in the financial uh, planning industry, um, you know, there are, there are some, you know, just like I'm sure with any industry, there are some people out there who are really more kind of um, driven by sales than they are necessarily giving you know, what's the best advice. And, um, and so I saw some of those tools as well. And it opened my eyes to, you know, those maybe here are some that, you know, for certain situations, they might be okay, but for the majority of people, they should look elsewhere, uh, you know, for, for those types of things. And some of those are around insurance products to be specific around different types of insurance products. Definitely, again, there are situations for those, those might be the best for you, but, um, there's a lot of other situations where they're probably not the best for most people too. Yeah, there can certainly be conflict of interest where, you know, commission earned sometimes dictates the advice given. Exactly. And this was something, this was actually a learning that I think probably a lot of listeners may have encountered, especially those who might have an interest in this area. But there's, there's two sort of standards, I guess, in the financial planning world. And one is called the fiduciary standard. And, and for those of you who aren't familiar, this is the one you want to look for. Um, because the fiduciary standard means that the advisor has to offer what's in your best interest. Now, that sort of sounds weird to say, because, well, what else is there? Right? I mean, like as veterinarians, like, there's, there's one way forward, what's in the pet's best interest, you know, um, but, but in, in the financial planning world, unfortunately, that is not, that is not the only uh, standard. There is something else called a suitability standard, which, you know, kind of my version of what that means is it just, just has to not be wrong. It doesn't have to be the most right, just has to not be wrong. And, and the suitability standard means is this, could this be a reasonable approach? And um, that's where, to your point, you start to get into, well, then, then you can sell a lot of things under that standard. Whereas the fiduciary standard, you, you can't, it has to be what's best for the client. So if you're looking for a financial planner, always be sure to ask them if they're a fiduciary. Um, because I, I've heard estimates that roughly about 10% are because they have to sort of sign up to, to, to do that. You can't sort of say you are one and then start selling people stuff. Okay. So sorry, just to clarify, only about 10% are a fiduciary and the other 90% fall under this suitability. That's the statistics that I've seen on that. Yes. Wow. That's fascinating. I did not know this. And so, and I didn't know that there was these two categories broken like this. You know, I intuitively knew there's good ones and bad ones. That's how I structured it in my head. So mm -hmm. for our, for our listener, for someone maybe looking for a financial planner, how do you find that? Like, is this a designation that they have to like stamp and pass tests for, or what are we looking for? Yeah. Um, well, um, what I normally tell people the, the, the way to look is look for, um, in, in North America, look for a CFP, a certified financial planner. Um, the, this is generally speaking the group 
that that you know you want to look toward um, to meet the fiduciary standard. And I think you're right, though. I mean, in any profession, there's going to be good ones and bad ones. And so I, I don't want you to necessarily think that any single person who's a CFP is, you know, that's automatically you're the top of the top. But I think in terms of like uh, the designations, that's a good one to start with for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So with this, Brent, with you diving into this graduate program, I mean, I love how I was asking you, I was like, okay, so, you know, what's the impetus for doing this? And you just, you said you have such a desire to, to help and educate veterinarians. And you specifically said you love helping people, you know, go from like step zero to step one, because you felt you can have the biggest impact there. And so, I mean, certainly something like getting set up with a financial planner that should be early on, you know, in your money steps, what other things, and I know we, we've said there's not a one size fits all, but there are common themes, you know, what would you say are, are some of those common themes that veterinarians starting out should be looking at? Great question. I think, you know, um, if you, if you're not doing a budget is sort of boring and not fun as that can sound to a lot of people. I, I think you have to start there because you have to understand where your money's going and it doesn't have to be a, a really complicated budget or, you know, super ornate, but, but you do need to have a sense of like wh- what's coming in and what's going out, how much and where. Um, and so I think that's kind of like the very foundational piece. And it's also you know, in a, in a way, and, and again, I remember this from when I was fresh out of school and had, you know, over two times the amount of loans that I have income, like this is a, a moment of reckoning in a way. And so it, it wasn't something that I, I can look back and say, well, that was a, that was a good day, but it led to better things. And, and so that's, that's what I would say is maybe step number one is, is, is just look at your finances and, and, and try to try to put it together in a budget so that you know where things are going. Now, once you do that, like a concrete action step that is like starting down the money path, I think is, is really to give yourself some slack. And, and what I mean by that is, is build an emergency fund. And most people will, I don't think there's any magic number that's right, but most people will say around $1,000 can handle a lot of life's consequences. And so if you want to make that your target, I mean, that's, that's simple enough to do, you know, that's you know, $20 a week for a year and you'll have a thousand dollars in your emergency fund. And then, you know, life can throw a lot of things at you that you can now cover. um, And that gives you a lot of breathing room because I I think, you know, everybody's different and kind of coming at it from a different direction, but a lot of things related to money that, that, that we want is not so much money or what money buys, but it's, it's the freedom that you get from being able to make choices on your own terms. And, and, that's why I always say start with this emergency fund because that's going to give you a, a measure of freedom that a lot of people don't have if they don't have one saved. If if you've got one already, that's fantastic. I think the next step is is um, you know you got to start to think about your debt and you got to start to think about saving for the future. Um, and and that the, both of those obviously that I've just simplified them with top lines, but those are both very complicated topics in and of themselves. But but I think you know I I prioritize the um, the emergency fund there first because of the relative amount of freedom that can give you just, just to get going and, and create space to do these other things. Yeah. It, you know, it's funny when you, I listened to our previous episode again and I, you pick out different things, different times through. And the thing that hit me on the second listening that I missed on the first one, when you talked about an emergency fund, you used a car example and you said, if your car breaks down and you don't have the money for it, now you have a car problem and a money problem, right? You, you, mm-hmm. It's compounded. Now you have two problems. Whereas if you have that emergency fund sitting there and your car breaks down, you know, no big deal. I have the money. I had a car problem, but I've already solved it. Let's move on. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's, it is that um, both the like tactically, you know, in the moment, the stress of it, but also just the, the freeing, like of the energy, knowing if that car problem happens, I don't have to worry about it. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I, I think I used that, that example or that type of example, because I had that happen to me in vet school where I had a car problem and it, and it was more that it became way more than a car problem. 
you know, it, it sort of wrecked me for a bit and I ended up racking up some credit card debt just to get through it. And, and it took a while to pay that off. And yeah, no, I mean, that's kind of, you know, my whole sort of thinking around this is just being able to sympathize with people who are in this spot, like, you know, not sort of like, um, this is, this is what I think about. This is more like, this is how I lived it too. And I want to help you because I was there. Yeah. And that's a tough one. Like, you know, we, we may have some listeners that listening to this that are in that moment right now, right? Where, where their emergency fund hasn't been started yet and they want to, but it's like life circumstances in their present moment are just very, very challenging, you know? And, and we had, we kind of were laughing about this in our, in our pre-recording where, you know, sometimes people will give advice and someone will look back at them and say, you know, that's, that's just doesn't work for me right now. So then their solution is to just give the same advice, but in a, in a higher tone of voice or more aggressively and, and think they've given different advice. And it's like, well, no, you didn't give anything different. So, you know, how do we navigate that? And I know this, I'm giving you the hardest question ever, like, but how, you know, how do people navigate that when they find themselves where it's like, man, this is a really tough spot. This is, I mean, this is one of the things that has sort of jumped out at me as I've begun to, to learn more about it, um, learn more about financial planning. And that, and that is that, you know, simply personal finance is more personal than finance. I know I said that on the previous show, but like our attitudes and the way we think about money is so complex. The math is, is pretty easy. Like, you know, you, in theory, in those situations, you know, you could probably take an accountant and say, look at this person's budget and find $20 a week. And they, they, they could, no problem, right off the top. But that person maybe can't see it or wouldn't make that same choice, even if they can see it because of their life circumstance. And I think to me, that is the most important part is you have to meet people where they are. And so, you know, um, if $20 a week is not manageable, is 10, is five. Um, you know, because to me, the, the, in that particular example of building emergency fund and maybe some other wealth building in the future is around the behavior. So if I can help you establish a good behavior, which is putting money back, um, you know, in this case for an emergency fund, but we'll, we can transfer that skill to other things to save for um, as well, then let's start where we start. And, and, you know, and see what we can do. And, and so that's where I'm, I feel like, yeah, this has to be so personalized to the person. And, and you have to ask a lot of questions because on the surface, it can, it can look just like math and, and, and the math's always there for sure. But like, it's the question behind the question. I think sometimes where you really get to what's the challenge here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. There's just so much layers of emotion wrapped in money. You know, and so, I mean, sometimes it feels like those are usually negative, but I mean, there can be a lot of, of good ones too. And, you know, you start to see that once you come on the other side, you know, your emergency fund is funded and you have some, your debt paid off and you have some investments on the flip side of things, money has this positive momentum as a positive tool that can really enhance your life. And you talked about it earlier driving towards freedom, it, it can start to unlock a lot of those things for you. Yeah, I think, and that's, you know, because money is one of those topics that some people are, well, a lot of people are just not comfortable to talk about it, you know, for, for a lot of different reasons, but even, you know, thinking about it, like uh, more generally, it's like, it's, it's always been one of those, you know, we don't talk about this, you know, that's a bit gauche to, to, to do that. And, you know, I think, if you reframe that to say, this isn't really about money for money's sake, it's about freedom, which I think we all sort of identify with. And there's, you know, that, that, that's a little bit more, I think, out in the open. And, and that's what, you know, to your point, that's really what th this can be. Now, I, I know it's not that for everybody. I mean, there are, you know, a lot of people who do really want to build wealth for, you know, other purposes too. Um, but honestly, a lot of it is just really about as, as humans, we just want to be able to make the choice we want to make and money is, is, you know, helps allow that. Absolutely. Okay, Brent. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for, for joining us again. I mean, I, I know I've said this, I know I keep repeating it, but I am truly blown away by, 
you know, having such a leader in the veterinary industry that is just recognizing, okay, I have a few gaps. I'm going to shore those up. I'm going to get a master's degree. I'm going to get educated. And it's all with the intention of, of just to help, right? Cause you said you're not a financial planner. You're not, you don't have products or services to sell someone. You just want veterinarians to live a better life and, and, and to do that by getting the money conversation going. So, I mean, I continue to, uh, to commend you and applaud you for it. It's, it's amazing stuff. Well, well, thank you for saying that. And, and thanks to, to you and Jonathan, because I, I love these podcasts and I'm, and I'm not just saying that. I think you guys, you have great guests, uh, not, not including myself, but you have great guests and, and you're, and you're talking about topics that I think are so important for our profession because there's plenty of clinical education elements out there that, that people can tune into, but, but you guys are bringing awareness to some of the people aspects of the profession. And I think that's, that's just as important. And I'm, and I'm just so happy that, that you guys are doing that. Yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, honestly, we love it too. This is, this is our version of going and getting a, a master's degree, you know, as a graduate program. When we started this, we said, we just want to talk with good people that are doing good things and, and broadcast that out for veterinarians to hear. And, and it's a blast, like catching up with people like yourself. So um, yeah. I'm not going to move you through our traditional impact round because you're, because you've already been through that. I'll just repeat for our guests that Brent is a cat person, just so they're reminded of that. Cause we love, we love our cats here. Um, but I will give you a chance uh, for the final word again, to, to kind of leave this episode, anything you would like to say to our veterinary community? Yes. Um, so, you know, I, uh, I really do uh, want to help educate as much as I can. So if, if you have, if you're part of a group or, or a VMA or anything that you might be interested in having, um, you know, an educational session on some of the foundations of personal finance, please reach out to me. I would love to talk to you about maybe getting something set up and you can, you can connect to me through, through LinkedIn. It's just on LinkedIn. It's just Brent Mayab, B-R-E-N-T-M-A-Y-A-B-B. And I'd, I'd love to connect and, and maybe see if we can set something up to, to talk about these things and keep the education going. Thank you for listening to the Veterinary Project Podcast. As a recap, on behalf of our hosts, the Veterinary Project Podcast will be releasing new episodes weekly. So be sure to tune in as we bring you more conversations aimed at helping you enjoy a life well lived. If you enjoyed what you heard on the show and you want to stay in the know, please like, love, and or subscribe to the podcast on the listening platform of your choosing, as we're available on all the usual suspects. If you know of others that may benefit from these conversations, we'd love it if you please share the show with them, as this will help us grow our community to reach more and more veterinary professionals. Speaking of which, if you are a veterinary professional and would like to get connected with more like-minded individuals who are joining us on this journey, please send an email to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com, and we'll invite you to be a part of our private Facebook group. General feedback, requests for information, or perhaps requests to be a guest on the show can also be sent to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com. Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light, thank you for listening to the show, and we'll catch you again next week for another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Bye for now.